I'll do it again. I'm going to bring this governing board of Yuma Elementary School District number one um, to begin. Uh, and um, the board, just a reminder, the board may convene into executive session to discuss personnel matters or to consult with the school district's attorney. Uh, another second reminder, due to the current health situation with COVID-19, Yuma School District 1 will hold our meeting to the public virtually via YouTube Live. The public is invited to view virtually on the District 1 YouTube page at Yuma School District 1. I'm now going to call the meeting to order with a Pledge of Allegiance and moment of silence. All rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and be, seat. be seated. We will now go on to item 1.2, which is the adoption of the agenda. Do I hear a motion? So moved. It's been moved by Irene. Second? Second. By Teresa. To accept the adoption of the agenda. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Passed unanimously. Now we will go on to item two, which is reports. Item 2.1 is the board report. This item provides the opportunity for each governing board member to report briefly on the items such as site visits, governmental relations, conferences, and meetings attended. Is there anyone that has uh, anything to report? Um, I, I went out to Ron Watson uh, early Right after the board meeting, the week after the board meeting, um, um, and I had to see the new facility. I just had to go see it, <laughs> and it is beautiful. Oh my gosh, that uh, the kitchen area is phenomenal, just gorgeous, and it's nice and big, and it's just oh, it just I I, I don't like to cook, and I even want to cook. <laughs> um, the um, wood shop is got all this beautiful equipment, and it's just kind of, you know, bittersweet because it's just sitting there, but, uh, but when, when the students get back, it's really state of the art, just pristine, beautiful, beautiful place. Um, and I got to visit with some of the staff and, you know, they're just looking for ways to engage students. And uh, we went into the art room, which is also part of that building. And the art teacher was talking about ways she wanted to get families involved and students involved and she looked at me she says do you have any ideas I'm like, well I'll think about it but I mean they're just reaching out for ways and um, Donna talked about that a few days before she'd had a student panel asking them what their needs were what their sentiments were what they were you know and um, sounded like she got a really a lot of good information from them um, the, the thing she said they really miss is interaction with one another so she, they're looking at ways of, of just having a little time during the class session for them just to, you know, they can break out in sessions and just to visit with each other because they miss that one-on-one, -on -one, you know, with each other. So uh, then I went across the street to Sunrise. I love that little school. It's just the cutest little school. And, um, you know, everything is just a matter of constantly juggling um, logistics. Um, how kids come in, how they go out, how they um, eat, you know, how they have their breaks. It's just a constant juggling that the principals are doing, and I was so proud. Um, uh, very positive, um, speaking about her staff, and um, uh, she had this beautiful uh, bouquet on her desk, and she said a staff member had given it to her. And so mm. they, uh, they appreciate what the principals are doing for them. Okay. And then just one little anecdote, um, I have a friend whose son is a kid, is a second a first grader at Palmcroft. And he struggled a lot last year and we we're a little worried about, you know, was he gonna pass or not? But 
Anyway, the other day she sent a group text to our little group of friends and she said that he was really sad because he thought Santa Claus was sending him coal. Oh. <laughs> because he can read now. <laughs> and she got a box from Coles. Oh. <laughs> And everybody's like, oh, poor thing. And I'm like, he can read! Exclamation <laughs> point. I was just happy. So, <laughs> so they are learning, you know, because he didn't read last year. Right. So anyway, it was kind of just a cute Great story. Sure. Very cute. Great. Okay, um, I just have one one thing to mention in reviewing the um, the board the board book. We all uh, each board member receives. Um, a calendar from each school and um, it was so nice to see on those calendars the last week of school this past week everybody had spirit week and I thought uh, how exciting was it to to have spirit week it, ver even though it was virtually you know they still had ugly sweater or <laughs> your favorite Christmas socks or Santa hat day I thought you know, kudos to our teachers to still keep the the traditions, Christmas traditions up. So um, I just wanted to do a quick shout out for that. Now on we'll go, now we'll, we will go on to the uh, item 2.2, .2, which is the superintendent's report. Mr. Sheldahl. Hey, Madam President, members of the board. <clears throat> I have a couple items before we get to the uh, the donations for the month. Uh, the Arizona uh, Board of Education met today, and uh, they had a couple impactful decisions. Uh, one was to extend the window. As you know, the, Nat the Department of Education, Federal Department of Education, has said that there won't be any waivers for state testing. But every year we have to do our state testing within a window, and it means that we usually have to do it like right when we get back from spring break. Mm -hmm. Well, they've extended that window now to the middle of May, so that gives us a little better uh, flexibility as far as um, getting kids back after spring break and being able to kind of stretch that out a little bit. So that, that was a bonus. And then a number, most of what the state board does <clears throat> is administrative, uh, and they execute the laws that are made by the legislature. But a couple of things that they're going to recommend to the legislature um, is that... Uh, the most impactful one is that the legislature not award school letter grades for 2020-2021. That's going to be the, the state. The state board is rec is going to recommend to the legislature that they do not award letter grades, the A through F letter grades for 2021. So to take the data from the tests, use it as baseline data, or use it as data to uh, assess, you know, where our kids are but not use that data to assign A through F letter grades. So that's, that's a positive thing. Great news. Yes. <laughs> what is there, do they have any kind of feeling on how that's going to fly? I mean, because there's some legislatures in that that are just... I don't want to jinx it. Okay, all right. <laughs> I hesitate to, uh, to make a guess on that. Okay. okay. And then finally, um, Yuma District 1 was called out uh, independently with 50, a total of 50 districts for being uh, districts who um, were very transparent in reporting their data. If you remember, we had to mm -hmm. uh, upload data about not only about our um, remote learning plan and our hybrid plan, but also about our um, our Galileo testing. And they we were given kudos today in the meeting uh, by the Department of Education as being one of the districts that was very transparent and helped them build their report to the board <clears throat> so that was uh, that was nice to get that yes. kind of individual yeah, recognition at the state board meeting for our district, and um, we received this week some really good feedback from the Department of Education on our migrant program. Um, some really nice compliments, and also from the Department of Education um, with our specialist around move on when reading, and they specifically called out Chris Abbott and how. How much they appreciate the work that he does, and how uh, how happy they are to work with him. So they were they made sure to let Dwayne uh, Shepherd know that they That's they really appreciate the the uh, the work that we get that they get um, and the information they get, and the timeliness of it, and the accuracy of it, and the ease ease of working with it. So we got a lot of kudos from 
up in the valley this week. So that's good. Good, good, good to hear. That's good. I love it. Um, next, <clears throat> I have a question for Mrs. Montoya. I, <laughs> does the date uh, December fifteenth, nineteen seventy-five, ring a bell? <laughs> That's probably when I started my career. <laughs> that was the date that you signed your first contract with wow. Eva Elementary School District number one. Wow. And uh, in my, I want to thank you too for making my research a little bit easier. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Besides just 45 years ago tomorrow. Wow. Um, wow. <laughs> you shared some information with me in the, in the, uh, the weekly report when yeah. I was doing the, the district history that you had just finished student teaching at McGraw. Mm -hmm. And Don Brown was your first boss. He, sure he hired you in December, the week before Christmas vacation. Yep. And you were to supervise instructional aides in the migrant and Title I programs. Yep. And he also wanted you to put together a brochure in our new, uh, to highlight programs in our new Title I program. Mm -hmm. And you said he handed you a fancy camera and told you to go to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You were 21 years old, had never supervised anyone, much less people who were older than you, which would be a challenge, <clears throat> and you had never used anything but an instamatic camera. So you said you went running to the church and prayed to St. Jude, the patron saint of impossible causes, cases and helpless causes. I did. <laughs> but then it worked out pretty well. Did, and then the, the next movie. semester, uh, in the fall, you were able to start actually teaching at McGraw School. Mm -hmm. Um, which is a school that you student taught out, so you, yes. you knew some people there. Then over the next 30 years, you served in many roles, including classroom teacher, building administrator, family resource coordinator, and I'm sure many more uh, official and unofficial roles in our district. ESL and migrant. Yeah, yep, ESL, migrant. Yeah. Um, and then December's always been a big month for you, apparently, because you were also appointed to the District 1 Board in December of 2014. Well, that's December, that's the year that's yeah. the month that gets to me. And you were sworn in uh, January of 2015. Yeah. Wow. And since then, you've served our board and oversaw the transition of superintendents, uh, the Red for Ed movement, and now the COVID-19 <laughs> challenge. Wow. Well. Uh, it may have only been six years, but you, it's been jam-packed with uh, interesting <laughs> activities. Uh, so you've been a champion for children and an amazing ambassador for our school district. And in, oh, excuse me. in your eyes, no child has ever been an impossible case or a hopeless cause. So we want to present you with a little token of our appreciation. And Alice has something behind you. So everybody mask up. <laughs> We're going to take a picture. Oh, mask on. And we're going to bid Irene farewell. Aww. Can we do this at the end? Aww. I know what else we're going to do. Oh, this is so. <laughs> I've been teary all day. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. So we have a little plaque for you. Oh. Uh, recognition of your value, service, and dedication oh, as a cool. school board member. Thank you so Mr. much. One December yeah. twenty twenty. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, Let's get a picture you. here. We'll do. We'll do the uh, traditional. <laughs> My best picture ever. So capital face. Thank you. Just a smidge, of Mr. Sheldon, and I'll get a better. Say that again. We can move the chair. I'll move the chair. I'm smiling. <laughs> We're smiling. <laughs> Our eyes are smiling. <laughs> Hope one moment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. With everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Love them. Oh my goodness. We just want to get well done. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Easier to hold smiles these days, huh? We're all yes. smiling. Say cheese. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much.
I took it out. Um, thank you so much for um, the, the beautiful tribute. It's been an honor to serve. Um, I joined, I wanted to be on the board because I wanted to give back to the district. It's been so good to me, um, not only as a, as a employee, but also as a student starting at Pecan Grove um, without a word of English. <laughs> and um, just so many fond memories. And um, I just feel like, uh, gosh, this has been a part of my life for really, it's been over 50 years when you put all the years together. <laughs> Um, and uh, you'll always be dear to my heart, and I'll always be praying and hoping for the best for all our students and for all of you. It's been an honor. Thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you, Irene. It's been a pleasure uh, working with you. Thank you. Oh, look. Oh. Oh. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so in January, we will swear in two new board members. We'll be back to five. Yeah, um, it takes two to replace Irene. Yes, <laughs> that's what I was going to say. <laughs> we could do it with four, but it takes two. So we will have uh, Faith Close Strike, and uh, recently um, uh, President Barbara Foote and our county superintendent conducted interviews, and uh, we'll be uh, swearing in Adele Henning. And I've known Mrs. Klostrak for quite some time. I, I'm familiar with Mrs. Hennig's family uh, unofficially. I'm looking forward to meeting with her this week. And uh, But by all accounts, um, I believe we're going to be um, welcoming two members who really uh, support the, uh, the, whole, the teaching of the whole child that we so value here in District 1. So we're looking forward, as we say goodbye to Irene, we're also looking forward to uh, our next next phase in January, where we welcome two new board members. Very exciting. Okay, I would like to recognize some donations. We, <clears throat> even though it was kind of a short month, we uh, we fared pretty well with generosity from our community. Um, McGraw Elementary School donation uh, from the Vertical Church. Appliances, furniture, and painter a painter to upgrade the teacher's lounge, which I think has not been upgraded since Irene Montoya did her speech. <laughs> no, we did menu, menu <laughs> And that was valued at $9,000. That's uh, Dorothy Hall Elementary School uh, got two donations from donors, donors choose, one for Ms. Newell's classroom, at uh, four, valued at $419 and one at Mrs. Doton's classroom, valued at $273. Uh, Raleigh also got a donation from Donor Choose for Mrs. Betrago's second grade and third grade class, um, valued at $999. Wow. And uh, Otondo's PTO uh, donated funds to be used at the, for the student council in the amount of $3,754.49. So very generous donation. Um, <clears throat> O.C. Johnson, donation from Arizona Community Foundation in the amount of $10,000 to improve literacy to be used for grades preschool through third grade. And O.C. Johnson also from Donors Choose, uh, the counselor, Ms. Escobedo, uh, received a donation uh, for arts and craft supplies for kids and uh, in the amount of $300. Palm Crop also got two donors choose uh, donations, one for Mrs. Garcia's kindergarten classroom in the amount of $365 and one for Mrs. Hale's kindergarten classroom in the amount of $290.93. Um, Palm Crop also got a donation from Realty One Group of backpacks filled with crayons and pencils for students. Uh, valued at $75. Uh, Ron Watson Elementary, donation from Maria Geis in uh, crafting stamp for, class, for art classes to be used, uh, and it's, that's a value of $400. Roosevelt Elementary received a, a nice donation of uh, Clorox wipes, 
stapler, staples, Kleenex, various items uh, from Grace Bible Fellowship, uh, valued in the amount of $850, and then a donation from Mr. Mike Suba, uh, who's been a great uh, supporter of Roosevelt School over the years, of hand, size, hand sanitizer and antibacterial wipes uh, in the amount of $244. Those are the high points in this month's donations that led to a total monthly donation of $27,123.82. And that brings our year-to-date total over $100,000 at $102,445.18, which uh, is, that's really something. We're usually not, we're usually not there by this time of year, so that's good. So a great big thank you to our generous community uh, for supporting our schools. Here, here. Before we leave that subject, I want to also throw a thank you to the United Way. This past week, or the week before, um, they had started a campaign for coats for kids yes. for Carver School, and they were able to collect either the new coats or money to buy new coats for every student at Carver School. And it's something, they weren't sure how it was going to go over, but it was the community so overwhelmingly supported it that they're going to continue, I think, and do other schools. So I just want to thank the United Way, Karina and Amy. And yeah, there was a really nice article in the paper yeah. about that yeah. the other day, and then and that donation will be coming before the board here in, in the future yeah. when it gets calculated. But yeah, the, I have no idea what the monetary I have amount no idea would be, but I'll have to try to I just thought, what a great idea, especially this time of the year, right. and especially with um, it you know, with the situation with COVID and everything. I just thought, what a great thing. So. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Karen, for making us aware. Okay, well, we're gonna go to item three, which is information items, and we're going to hear the 80th day enrollment count from Elizabeth Valenzuela. Elizabeth. Yes. Madam President, Governing Board members, um, our 80th day enrollment compared to last fiscal year uh, was down by 5%. Um, which is a total of 478 students. Um, our enrollment did increase, uh, oh, the 60th day count, it increased by 32 students compared to that day. Um, and our 100th day is on January 22nd. So we'll see where we're at that day and we'll bring that to the board. Okay, thank you. Um, we will now go on to item 3.2, which is the district financial trends. Elizabeth, again. Yes, Madam President, Governing Board members. Um, year to date, we've expended 32% of our maintenance and operation budget um, and 64% of our capital. Uh, last fiscal year at this time, M&O was at 32% year to date and capital was at 74%, so uh, comparable. Um, and I want to just bring this to your attention that this financial trend summary does not reflect um, the changes that were presented during the public hearing. So that will be reflected on next month's um, financial trend summary once it's approved by the board. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Okay, now we're gonna go to uh, item four, which is call to the public. The governing board welcomes statements from residents and appreciates constructive suggestions and comments that help meet the education needs of the district. A form to submit your comments and suggestions can be found on our website at www.yuma.org. The completed form should be submitted by 4 p.m. the day of the meeting, which is traditionally the second Monday of the month. Do we have any items, Christine? Okay, there being none, we will go to the uh, consent agenda. Approval of these items are of a routine nature and those that normally do not require deliberations on the part of the governing board. A board member may pull items which will be discussed and voted on separately. Do I hear any items that need to be pulled? Okay, there being none, um, I need uh, a motion to approve the consent agenda as is. Do I um, hear a motion? So moved. It's been moved by Karen, second by second, second by Irene to accept the consent agenda as 
printed. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passed unanimous, unanimously. We will now go on to item six, which is the action items. 6.1 is the consideration to approve the student calendar. Luciano. Madam President, governing board members, happy holidays. I'm connecting from my home this evening, so I just wanted to say that before uh, the end of the meeting. Um, I just wanted to start off by saying I want to give a huge shout out to the calendar committee. I want to say high five. They did a great job. Uh, they've been working over the last two months to bring the student calendar recommendations. So yes, if you want to use your clappers, I know we're not having high five this month, but we want to give them recognition. It is a tedious process and we go through so much feedback and input but they have done a phenomenal job again. So I wanna share my screen to show you a video that details the process. Can everyone see the screen? Yes. Okay. Hi, I'm Sarah Carey from uh, 4th Avenue Junior High. Um, this is my first year on the calendar committee. Uh, it was a great experience. I liked how they had us meet in small groups to discuss all the options. And then we would give our feedback to everyone and we all got to voice our opinion. Uh, it was a very uh, good process. It went very smoothly and uh, I wouldn't mind being on it again. Hi, I'm Connie Newman and I'm the guidance counselor at Ron Watson Middle School. I was also our site representative on the calendar committee this year. I've also served in this capacity for in several years before this. The role of the site representative in the calendar committee is to be the liaison between the school and the calendar committee. Um, the job is to bring um, information to all of the staff members and then take their input back to the committee to make final decisions on our calendar. Hi, my name is Ron Sheeper, Director of Transportation. This year with the calendar committee, we met a little bit differently. We met remotely and we were able to do breakout sessions. We were able to really communicate very clearly, very openly. And the process went very smooth to get from the six calendar options down to four. Hi, my name is Jasmine Campos and I am from OC Johnson. So for the calendar committee um, in the first meeting, we narrowed down these six options down to four. And from there, we went ahead and went back to our site and went ahead and asked our entire staff to go ahead and vote on their favorite two calendar options for the next uh, upcoming two school years. Um, from there, once we received our options for our site and what they thought was the best, um, we went ahead and had our second meeting. In our breakout sessions during meeting two, we went ahead and discussed ways that those two options were going to benefit our students, the employees, and the parents of our district. Hi, I'm Shiloh Jones. I teach math at Castle Dome Middle School. We wanted all parents and employees to have an opportunity to voice their opinions about the coming calendar. We sent out electronic and paper forms that were both in English and Spanish. Here are the results. Employee results. We had a total of 535 employees respond. Here is a breakdown of the groups. Here are the employee voting results. Here's a breakdown of the parent voting at each school. Here are the results of the parent voting.
Here is a side-by-side -side view of both the parents and the employees' votes. As you can see, it's clear that both groups prefer the first option of our calendar. Hello, I am Nareda Cochran. I am an elementary school teacher at Dorothy Hall. I teach third grade. I have been in the calendar committee for several years now, and we have reviewed parent and employee feedback. And on behalf of the calendar committee, we recommend dun, 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 calendar option one for the following next two years. We thank you all of you who participated in the surveys. Let's give them all one more round of applause. They did an amazing job. <laughs> What we summarized in four minutes really took about two and a half months to to develop um, getting feedback from parents, getting feedback from employees. This has been a record year when it came to the number of responses we had uh, from both employees and parents. So I'm very thankful for that. Um, I've been facilitating this process for nine years now, and I love our district process. I know it's tedious and it's comprehensive, but it really allows everyone to have an opportunity to voice their opinion and have it considered. So. Uh, with that said, Governing Board, it is the administrative recommendation that the Governing Board approve the student calendar um, as presented for the next two years. Thank you, Luciano. Board members, do I hear a, a motion to approve uh, the proposed student calendar for school year 2021-22 and 22-23 school years? Mm. It's been moved by Teresa. A second? Second. By Karen. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passed unanimously. We will now go on to item 6.2, which is consideration to, prove, to approve the 2020-2021 budget re revision. Elizabeth. Yes, Madam President, Governing Board members, um, it is recommended that the Governing Board approve the fiscal year 2020-2021 budget revision as presented during the public hearing. Is there any, are there any additional questions? Okay, um, at this time then, um, it is recommended that the governing board approve the 2020-2021 budget revision. Do I hear a motion? So moved. It's been moved by Karen and seconded by Irene. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passed unanimously. We will now um, go on to six point, item 6.3, discussion and possible action on a decision to begin the spring 2021 20, semester in the remote with on-site support model until district adopted benchmarks indicate a safe transition to the hybrid model. Mr. Sheldon. Yes, Madam President, members of the board. <clears throat> um, currently, we've, we finished the semester in remote instruction with on-site support. Uh, that decision was made based on the level of community spread of COVID-19. And uh, our district has um, formally adopted the Arizona Department of Health Services uh, benchmarks. And uh, my recommendation is that we make the decision tonight that we will begin in January 4th in the same model that we ended the semester in. In other words, begin the semester in um, remote with on-site support. This will, making this decision tonight will give everybody, both employees and parents, uh, plenty of time to, to plan for that first, uh, first few days of uh, at the second semester, so it'll give good, good transparency and good for forewarning for everybody about what our uh, what our start is going to be like. Um, all the benchmarks currently are trending in the wrong direction. I don't know that it's uh, it'd be. I think it'd be overly optimistic to think that they're uh, over the next few weeks going to uh, trend downward significantly in order to uh, to start uh, in in a hybrid model. Um, so my recommendation is that the board consider uh, making a decision tonight to start on January 4th, the second semester in remote instruction with online with on-site support. 
And also, we will still have the morals. Yes, that's the on-site support for morals, yes. And um, most of the staff is going on campus to, is yes. reporting to campus. It, yes, unless there's, unless they work with their principal and there's, an, there's a um, good reason to make an accommodation, um, they are working on site. And we had very, very few uh, between Thanksgiving and the end of the semester very, very few folks who, uh, who needed to be accommodated. This would also be with the understanding that at any time those benchmarks reflect, um, am, I push, am I going ahead of myself? That any time those benchmarks reflect uh, improvement for a two week period that we will let you make the decision on coming back to on in, in person learning. Yes, cur currently. Just like we did before. Currently, we yeah. Currently, the the board has approved earlier in the year to follow the Arizona right. Department of Health Services uh, benchmarks and give the superintendent authority to to make that decision. But this item is is mainly just addressing the return to. Correct. To school in January. Right. I want. I wanted to yeah. split out the next two items just to make this one very clear, yeah. and then I didn't want to have any uh, kind of interference between the two discussions, uh, or to, so that I want. I want to be very clear uh, how we're going to start, and then we can go on to the next uh, next discussion about um, yeah. main about continuing with our recommendations or um, or monitoring them or modifying them. I think making this decision right now is, is going to be um, good families and teachers and everybody knows just what to expect and there's no, you know, what's going to happen. They know if this is, whatever we decide, that's what we're going to do and they all know how to plan it. So, yeah. I agree. I think we need to make the decision instead of just discussing it tonight and waiting to make the decision because there, we're already on um, Christmas break, and we need to to let everybody know, right? So we're not in a hurry up mode to do it. Correct, correct. We're, I think we're being pre proactive, not reactive. So, um, do I hear a motion to um, continue beginning uh, in January to begin with uh, remote instruction with on site support? and grant the superintendent authority to carry out uh, the rec recommendation. So moved. It's been moved by Karen, second by? Second. Second by Teresa to um, return in January to remote instruction with on-site support and grant the superintendent authority to carry out the recommendation. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passed. We will now um, go on to item 6.4, discussion and possible action on a decision-making matrix for returning to in-person instruction in the hybrid model. Mr. Sheldahl. So I, I wrote some background here, but <clears throat> the crux of this item is, do we want to stay the course with the uh, ADHS um, dashboard guidelines, which are centered around percent of positivity, cases per 100,000 residents, and COVID-like illness at, at the hospital. Um, we've, we've learned quite a bit uh, since we made that decision. One thing we've learned is that that third indicator about COVID-like illness at the hospital is maybe not as valid a measure as the other two. Uh, we, I shared some information in the last couple of weeks in the um, in the Friday report about uh, some research done by uh, some folks at U of A who um, their, their advice to boards is that they don't really look at that third one, that they just look at that they use the first two. And I also shared an interactive dashboard that actually breaks down the hospitalization by county because for that third benchmark, Yuma County is uh, included along with La Paz and Mojave counties. So it's not a true county level uh, data point. It's actually a regional data point, uh, whereas the other two are true county level data points. So 
tonight I just I wanted to open up for discussion as to whether the board thinks we should continue to use those um, those ADHS benchmarks all three of them two of the three um, whether we need to modify them you know what I've said from the beginning is that's really the only, that's primarily that's the that's the objective uh, guidance that we've been given this year that's about, that's about the only truly objective guidance that we've been given from an authoritative source um, on this but we also know from our from practice that we've had um, we've had good success with our mitigation plan we've got a strong model in our hybrid model um, so the question is do we want to modify the matrix do we want to or do we want to uh, continue to use the ADHS benchmarks when when we make the determination to return to hybrid learning and subsequently to five five day well there's there's really no other um, data that we can use at this point right I mean there's not other agencies that have data that we can rely on no other agencies have given us any kind of objective mm -hmm. data yeah. um, well, aren't the other agencies using the Department of Health's data too but it's some of it I mean maybe not word for word but aren't they getting their information from the Department as, of Health as far as I know as far as I know okay I think that that third uh, benchmark since it's not UMA specific I think that that should be off the table. Mm -hmm. I'd agree. I don't know if you guys agree with that. I think if we meet, if, yeah, we do two, the first two. two out of two. Right. right. It's, it's not two out of three, two out of two, the first two. We have to meet those. I'll take the third one off the table. And yes, and I think how we did it last time where we gave a week, the school a week, you know, they're not going right. to go the next day or something, give right. the right we, time to prepare families. And right, family. we made an announcement on a Thursday for a week from the following Monday to give. Now, we, we may be able to shorten that cycle this time around if, if need be because we, we've done it. Yeah. And, you know, we, we had, I have to tell you, I have to really commend our teachers and our um, principals with how smoothly the transition after Thanksgiving went to uh, back to remote with on-site support. So it was just, uh, it was seamless. So they, you know, they've, uh, they've been learning a lot along the way and they're very prepared and I think they can, you know, they can transition pretty soon, pretty quickly. Um, question is how, you know, how much notice do we need uh, to give our parents as well? I think we need to take that into consideration with ample notification for the parents. And I think it's important that we can, can move through the second semester. I'm very optimistic, actually. I'm, I think I'm more, opti more optimistic maybe than a, a lot of people um, that things are going to continue to improve as the semester goes along. And I think if we can, if we can make sure that we have good measures to take each step that we can put ourselves in a position where we can take forward steps the entire time and not have to take steps back. Um, I think this, the, the challenge of pushing the envelope can be that you move too quickly and then you have to pull back mm -hmm, yeah. and that, that creates a disruption for, for everybody. Or you have to push, you have to pull back with one school or another school. Yeah. That's a disruption too. Um, you know, for a parent to get a call on a, on a Friday or a Saturday and find out that they're they're going to need to find a place for their kid on Monday uh, because their schools had an outbreak that's I think that's a uh, that's disruptive as well we will continue to offer options for parents hybrid or still continue with remote until yes this ends up. yes okay. as long as there's those options I think that's very important Yeah, and I would hate to see us, like Jamie was saying, step backwards. We haven't done that yet. We've always been going forward with our decisions, and I, we, think, I think that's the best way to go is just continue as we have been doing 
and removing that last benchmark and just using the first two, um, I think is a good way to go. And I don't, I think our parents, um, they're pretty, they've been pretty adaptable, our families, as far as what we've decided, how we have to move forward. And I, I think that we're doing the best that we can right now. I agree. And the extent to which, <clears throat> I can't make this prediction, I'm not a statistician, but the extent to which that third one is such a lagging indicator, I mean, it, it, it lags far behind um, those first two. Those first two indicators are a little, a little more current. And they, even then, they're still about a couple weeks. They reflect data from a, a couple weeks um, prior, 12 days prior. Um, but that third indicator follows those two. So, for example, when we saw the uptick in in cases and percent positivity, it was a couple weeks later that the hospitalization rate started to come up. So, you know, there's a chance that's going to be the same thing coming down, and that that, that would be that would lag behind as well. So, I think for responsiveness, I think those top two are more uh, they're more responsive. Correct. Mm -hmm. Right. They're, more indica they're indicating more of what's going on. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I did just one last thing. I did, um, we discussed this with all of our principals. Um, and that's, you know, they believe that, uh, they believe that parents, um, you know, they have a soft choice. They can come to the, to the five day, to the morals. And, uh, that the that our board's um, decisions to use data based decision making um, has has carried a lot of weight with our faculty and staff, and that uh, it's it's really helped keep um, make our faculty and staff feel like uh, like they know what to expect. Got some some uh, predictability in the leadership of the, you know, of the board. And that really uh, helps with working conditions and with morale for the faculty and staff as well, so. I think as, as Barbara says, it affirms our staff that we want to keep them safe. We mm -hmm. want to keep everybody safe, mm -hmm. right? But it's so affirming to know that we're not just, you know, flying. We're, we're looking at data, we're looking at science, not just our own opinion or I think the ability to follow the data is is uh, reassuring, and it's like Irene just said. You know, how can you go wrong with with science? I mean, the the data points are out there, the information's out there. It's not being skewed in any any form or shape or form. We're just following um, the guidelines of what the Department of Health has set up. So at this point, I do I hear a motion um, or I make a motion that the govern, governing board follow the decision making matrix that the health department has set up for us, except for uh, the third one, which is uh, the third point, which they stated um, with regards to our hospital. Uh, drop that and just leave the two uh, remaining uh, points, the positivity and uh, cases per 100,000. And yeah. cases per 100,000. There you go. Yeah. So moved. Did you, oh, do I need to say it? <laughs> I can't say what you said. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm kind of confused. Are, we're adding an, uh, an action, we're adding to the 6.4, or we're yes. revising it? So we're, we're revising Six our point. practice. Okay. So our practice reflects all three benchmarks, and... We're revising the practice of only reflecting so two. two. The, yeah, so the, 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 the motion would be that District 1 continue to follow the... Uh, Arizona Department of Health Services guidelines for percent positive 
and the number cases, of cases. And for number of cases per 100,000. Got it. Okay, second. So I think Barb made the motion. Yeah. Okay. okay. So I second. Yeah. It's been moved by Irene and seconded by Karen. Okay. To approve our decision making matrix to continue the guidelines for the uh, set up by the Arizona Department of Health to strictly concentrate on two points our positivity rate and the cases per 100,000. All those in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> Opposed? Motion passed unanimously. Sorry for that confusion. That's okay. We will now go on to item 6.5, discussion of the superintendent's evaluation. And at this time, um, the board reserves the right to go into executive session. And um, and we will be back. I need a to go into uh, and I need a motion to go into executive session. It's been moved by Teresa and seconded by so moved. Or second. Karen to go into executive session. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passed. Can we just turn off our microphones? Yeah. Or do I? We can take a couple. Oh.